Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. There may be some uh, more people that uh, wander in as we're going through this, and that's, that's good as well. Uh, welcome to my last State of the University address in Springfield. Uh, today, the plan is I'm going to give about a 20, maybe 25 minute talk, uh, highlighting some of the uh, achievements from the last uh, 12 and a half years and sharing census data from last week. I will then take questions from you on any subject except the search process. Uh, I'm not involved in that anymore. Uh, I will then turn the stage over uh, to search chair Rob Fulp, who will make a short presentation on that search process and timeline, and will then get your input on what is important to you about the 12th Missouri State University president. As always, there are a couple of ways you can uh, ask questions and give feedback. They are on the slide. Uh, and of course, you're always welcome uh, to ask me something or give me feedback privately. And if so, just send me an email uh, at president at missouristate.edu. All right, with that introduction, let's get started. Uh, you know, as I look back over my time as president of the university, I'm uh, very proud of so many of our accomplishments. Uh, I think it's fair to say it's not the same place it was when I began on June 27th of 2011. Uh, at the top of the list for me is right here uh, on this slide, obtaining the status as a professional doctoral university. And folks, this was a major challenge. Uh, the first thing we had to do was get uh, the law changed to allow this to occur. That was a two to three year process that was achieved in 2019. We then had to convince the uh, coordinating board over the strenuous objections of the University of Missouri and the Higher Learning Commission that we had earned it. And we achieved those goals last year. And so this year, we have our first Doctor of Psychology cohort that has started. And next year, I hope we'll have our first Doctor of Education cohort starting. And we didn't have to ask our friends up north for permission to do that. And so for all of you that were uh, involved in this, thank you for making it happen. I see a big smile on Dean Masterson's face uh, in the audience for this. It forever changes us for the better uh, and impacts everyone who will get a degree from this university. And so uh, really well done. Uh, we have other academic achievements uh, during my tenure, um, including uh, the complete reorganization of our academic structure, uh, which will be finished by the end of this academic year, although John tells me it's an ever-continuing, evolving process. Um, and thanks to our provost, thanks to the dean's team, and those serving on work groups for the really good work here. Uh, there's more to be done this year, uh, and I've, I've promised that I'm not leaving until it's finished, and so we're going to make sure uh, it all happens. We have hit record uh, undergraduate, graduate, international, and underrepresented student enrollment records during my time as president. That's important because the more students who receive degrees the more lives are changed for the better. Enrollment also funds the university and provides talent uh, for everyone who has uh, businesses here. Um, the last few years had seen a uh, backward movement in some of these categories because of the pandemic and other factors, but re we rebounded big this year. Census data became final last Monday, uh, and the numbers are really good. And so I'm gonna share those with you now. We count enrollment in two basic ways. I'm, I'm sure we've got counters that count 100 different ways, but two basic ways that we're counting enrollment, and they are head count, total number of students taking a class here, and then credit hours. 
the good news is we are up in both after being down in both last year. That second number, the uh, credit hour number, up 3.4% is really important, uh, as it means we will hit budget numbers this year and no uh, reductions will be necessary. Remember, we started last year because we didn't hit that number, cutting $5 million out of our budget. And so, uh, much better place to be this year. Four uh, subcategories to really call out. Uh, and um, um, I, I think the biggest one is the third, that third line, first time new in college, our freshman class grew by 22%, up 504 students from a year ago. Um, that's the biggest year-over-year -year increase in our history and the w result of really, really good work. Uh, we also hit another graduate student enrollment uh, record. Is that five years in a row, Julie, I think? Seven years in a row we've hit uh, a new graduate student enrollment. Headcount was up over 900 students. Um, and you know, that last number is really important. We, we live in a state where, there's, where there, it, there are sometimes challenges if you're not a part of the majority group. And yet, uh, we grew by 370 underrepresented students this year over last. And uh, I'm really pleased with that. Um, this chart, yeah, I think you can see it. Um, so, so this is headcount enrollment since 1994, uh, when we became a, uh, a selective admit university. So really, you know, from that beginning, okay, we're a selective admission university. Uh, OTC is here as the open enrollment university. What's our growth been? You see where the name change came in, 2005? Uh, I came in that second big dot, 2011, when Frank and I uh, were named interim president and, and interim provost. Uh, enrollment at that point was just uh, below 21,000. Uh, we had seven good years of growth in a row. We then had kind of leveled off and were stable right at about uh, 24,000 students. And then the pandemic took a little bit of a lick and we had uh, two down years. And this year we have rebounded uh, to above 24,000 students again on the Springfield campus. It's the third largest enrollment in our history. I think we're 166 students below that top enrollment year in 2018. Um, turning, um, turning the enrollment decline around was our number one priority last year. Uh, and we were successful in doing that because so many of you made that a priority. So again, thank you for uh, some really good work there. Now we have to build on that success. Um, we can and need to get back to a freshman class of 3,000, uh, and we are not that far away with a great fall class. Last slide I talked to, uh, another part of enrollment is retention, right? It's not just who starts here, but do they continue on here and do they ultimately graduate? We got back to closer where we should be on retention this year. You see our goal, the board set a goal for us to be at 82% uh, by 2026. And those two big pandemic years, uh, again, impacted our students significantly. Uh, we are now back to over 79%. Again, that 79.3% is a new university record. But, but it comes with a little bit of a caveat or a warning, right? It's going to be hard to move this number up, uh, given the growth we've had in first generation and Pell eligible students, but it must be a priority. If we're not graduating our students, there is little point in recruiting them. And many efforts are underway this semester to provide the needed support uh, for our students to be successful. 
Uh, throughout my tenure, we have maintained our status as the most affordable large university in both our state and in our region. This has been a board priority my entire time here because almost all of our students come from working in middle class families and cost is important, maybe the most important factor, not in deciding where they're gonna go to college, but in deciding if they're going to go to college. And college has to be for everyone. College cannot just be for those from affluent families. And while our competitor up north drastically raised their tuition prices this year, we stayed below CPI yet again. We instituted the Most State Access Scholarship Program, making it possible for Pell eligible Missouri students to attend the university, owing us nothing for fees and tuition. And by doing that, we also increased our revenue because they bring that federal and state aid with them. This scholarship gave us a distinct advantage in recruiting this year, and it will be an advantage for years to come. But it also changes the makeup of our freshman class, making our focus on retention even more critical, as I mentioned earlier. We achieved record state funding this year and each of the last four years. Important to note these records were all achieved under Governor Parson, and I believe I played a major role in helping the governor understand the importance of higher education in workforce development. He is a huge supporter, not only of our university, but of higher education generally. Go back one, go back to that slide, Suzanne. Let's go back to the chart, there we go. The other thing I wanted to point out was that we had a big $10 million jump from 2019 uh, to 2020. Uh, that was the work primarily of State Senator Lincoln Huff. Ryan DeBoof, who's here, led our advocacy work in that year to get us caught up to where the funding level was for many other universities. Again, Governor Parson was the governor who signed that budget into law. All right, now we can move to the next slide. Um, I never thought we would be able to renovate Temple Hall during my tenure. It was just going to be too expensive. There was just not money uh, for capital projects. But the last two years, we were able to raise $135 million in federal and state funding through relationships built with Senator Blunt, Governor Parson, State Senator Huff, to fund the complete expansion and renovation of what we now call Blunt Hall. And to begin the renovation of Cheek Hall and to do additional renovation in Camp Peter Hall. We set records uh, uh, for external funding in both fundraising and contracts and grants while completing uh, the two largest campaigns in university history. And unlike so many universities, we are financially sound. Having balanced our budget every single year, reduced our debt during my tenure, refinanced debt so that we are actually making money on our debt, uh, filled the hole left by the John Q. Hammond's default on his gift to Great Southern Bank Arena, and we have the largest reserves in the history of the university. We've made progress in becoming a more diverse and inclusive university as this slide and the next one show. Uh, a part of that was bringing the Student African American Brotherhood to campus, uh, not only on our campus, but their whole organization. Uh, and my commitment to you is we will continue this work as long as I am here. Uh, our campus does not look and feel the same as it did 12 years ago. Um, we have added the Davis Harrington Welcome Center, Majors Health and Wellness Clinic, Allison North and South Stadiums, those were paid for completely with student funding, by the way, 
uh, O'Reilly Clinical Health Sciences Center, the John Goodman Amphitheater, and renovated the Grand Street underpass, Ellis, Hill, Glass, Campeter, and Pummel Halls, along with many facilities on the West Plains campus. This not only helps us recruit better students, faculty, and staff, it helps us provide better education and services to them all. Public-private partnerships have been an emphasis. Uh, they have benefited us as well, and our new partnership uh, with Cox Health, Ozarks Technical Community College, and Springfield Public Schools, and what we call the Alliance for Healthcare Education, uh, has the potential to be the most meaningful partnership yet. Down at Idea Commons, we have created literally thousands of jobs and lead the region in economic development and entrepreneurship. And finally, we have we led the university successfully through the pandemic, reopening as a residential campus in the fall of 2020 and without anyone losing their job. 2020 and 2021 were really hard years. Thank you all for going beyond what was required again and again to help our students be successful during this difficult time. You know, there's more work to do in my last nine months at the helm. I'm not counting down the days yet or crossing them off a calendar. Uh, but my point in sharing all of this with you, besides hoping we all feel pride in the university we work in or attend, is to make it clear we should be able to attract excellent candidates to become the 12th president of Missouri State University. We are in great shape, and there is continued potential to build on the good work we have done these past 12 years. So I want to talk about that briefly. Uh, so the slide you have up now shows the Presidential Search Committee. This is the committee that will lead their work. It is led by alum and successful businessman Rob Fulp. Rob's here today, I'll introduce him separately in a minute. Uh, many of the search committee members are here today to, per to listen to the conversation and the input uh, that happens later on. The search will be staffed by these three capable people. Our general counsel, Rachel Dockery, uh, our vice president of uh, marketing and research, Suzanne Shaw, uh, and running the logistics of the whole thing is our board secretary, Rowena Stone. The board decided not to hire a recruiting firm as our experience with them uh, has not frankly been successful on past major searches. And we know these three people are tremendously capable of running this level of search and can do it with very little cost. I'm happy to answer questions on any topic and we can take, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions regarding the search in terms of up through the formation of the search committee, but not beyond. That's, uh, that's Rob's piece later on. Um, and before we start the q and I want to let everyone know that we're doing a meet and greet. This is not goodbye to the president. This is a chance for all of us to get together at the Welcome Center, have coffee, uh, um, iced tea, snacks, uh, and visit. Continue any conversations we start now or visit with the entire leadership team. Our administrative council will be there. Our dean's team will be there and they're welcome for you to come by and, and join us this afternoon and in the day talking about anything uh, or nothing that's on uh, your mind. Four o'clock at the Welcome Center. With that, uh, let's uh, stop and I will, um, uh, I'll take questions. As always, we start with Keyshore. Now Keyshore, you only get one first question, right? So we're going to do your first question here. When Rob's up here and he's taking questions, let somebody else go first, okay? That's my request. Go ahead, stand up, give us your question. Thank you, as always, President Smart, 
very good job over the years. Thank you. Uh, um, both of my questions only you can answer. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I came then. <laughs> I remember reading a few months ago that the board wanted strong internal candidate for the presidential search. Yes. My question is, are there ethnic minorities and women who are possibly strong internal candidates right now? Um, I think that there are certainly uh, women and people of color that could compete for the presidential job here that work here now. Uh, we have uh, people of color and women in uh, leadership positions on both the administrative and academic teams. Uh, they have not shared with me, all of them, whether they will apply or not, and that's totally appropriate because, again, I'm not going to be the person choosing the finalists or making the selection for who the next president is, and I would encourage all of our team, if you're in a leadership position here and you believe you're ready uh, for, to, to take on this role, then you should compete for it. I, I am a strong believer in competition. Competition is good. That's the reason we'll do a national search. That's the reason we will try to get as many uh, good candidates from all backgrounds into the pool. We want to make it really hard on the search committee to narrow that group down to three or four people to then turn over to the board. Thank you. I have one more. You bet. <laughs> uh, uh, I read the presidential search committee charges and I noticed that there are some very strong confidentiality clauses uh, 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 and it applies to the presidential search committee. Fine. My question is, will similar policy also apply university-wide to lower level searches, or is this only for presidential searches? So I would hope the confidentiality, Rachel, you wanna, okay. Ra Rachel wants to answer this <laughs> so that I don't screw it up. Rachel, go ahead. This is why I have a lawyer. Rachel, take it away. So Dr. Shaw, it already applies to every search on campus. Operating Policy 7.10, which is our hiring guidelines, there is a provision, 1.7 on confidentiality. It is coextensive with the language to the charge. Because this committee includes a number of community members who are not familiar with university policy, we thought it both important and appropriate to highlight it there but it's not a change. So that's absolutely correct, and I would have said that, I promise, I would have said that. <laughs> the other thing I would, would say is as to the importance of it, right? So, so, so part of you know, the, what I've been talking about the last 20 minutes is, this is a great place to be a president of. We are financially sound, we are growing. Uh, it, it, it's a major university. We think we'll have lots of great candidates. If you're the president of a university and you apply and you don't make the final pool, it's really important that that remain confidential. Otherwise, that person's job is in jeopardy where he, he or she is, right? Uh, likewise, who decides that they don't want to apply. That could be uh, something that's very sensitive to a person. Hey, we have an internal candidate. He or she has decided not to apply, and that person may not want that widely known, right? And so to get the best pool of candidates together and pr to protect their integrity, it's really important that the search committee not divulge, in particular, the names of who's in and who's out, right? And, and I think that's the piece that we're trying to emphasize. And as, as Rachel said, everyone is not as familiar with our rules. And we, the board uh, wanted to make sure that point was emphasized as a part of the charge. Very good. Again, I, I mandate it that the whole academic and administrative leadership team comes to this because they often have better information than I have. Other questions? Anyone? 
before we get I have one. I have one from Zoom. Okay. All right. What do you foresee as the primary challenge facing the university in the coming years? Yeah. Um, so I think there's several challenges uh, out there. Uh, all of us that read the Chronicle and Inside Higher Ed know, know many of them. Uh, enrollment is going to continue to be a challenge as, as families evaluate the return on investment of a student going to college. That's why affordability is really important. Um, you know, we've been in a time of, uh, um, frankly, of, of significant resources that we haven't had. That, that's not going to end forever. The federal money's wrapping up here in the next year or two. Uh, governor Parson can't run for re-election. We're going to have a different governor. We don't know uh, what his or her emphasis would be on education. Um, there are significant cultural challenges next year as an election year. Uh, you know, I see the, the bills that have passed in other states that limit, frankly, our ability to teach certain things and talk about certain things. I think that's a significant challenge that we're uh, working to face and be prepared for and try to keep from happening. Uh, there are a lot of competitors in the marketplace as businesses begin to teach their own employees the things they know instead of funding them to go to college, hence the importance of employer partnership work that we're doing um, there. You know, the world continues to change. I think on the academic side, the whole invention, the whole chat GPT AI uh, is a revolutionary development. It's, I don't think it's gonna replace people, but it's gonna change people's jobs and it's gonna be really important that our graduates are familiar with and know how to ethically use that new uh, tool. And so lots of challenges ahead. Uh, the universities that are open to change, the universities that are willing to think about how to redesign and do things differently are going to be the universities that succeed. Uh, I, I think in every situation there are winners and losers. And the way to be a winner is to be on the cutting edge and keep up with change and remain relevant to families and students living in our state. What else? <laughs> What's next in my life? Um, uh, Gail's, Gail, who's here and uh, uh, who has uh, uh, been a huge part of everything we've done, particularly on, on the external side, just uh, a, a tremendous important piece of of who I am and uh, our success, Gail says that something else will come my way. Uh, something, something interesting and exciting uh, will come my way, maybe. I don't know what that is. I don't want to work for anybody anymore. Um, but I like doing interesting things. And so if there was a short-term consulting project, if there was a short-term kind of position to do for a period of time that I thought I could make a difference in, I might be open to that. Uh, we're gonna continue to live in Springfield, gonna continue to be involved in the community. I'm on the community, uh, I'm on several boards, including uh, City Utilities, United Way, uh, chair the Missouri Partnership, which is the, leading group for economic development in the whole state of Missouri. I expect to do that the next several years. Uh, we're gonna be involved in volunteer and philanthropic work. We've got six grandchildren. It was really fun to spend the day yesterday with the two oldest at Silver Dollar City. Uh, there are a lot of places I haven't seen. There are a lot of books I haven't read. There are, I, I think I'm gonna be fine. Um, but I don't have a specific thing lined up. I know I'm not going to practice law ever again. I know that I'm not going to be president of any other university. <laughs> All right. With that, I'm going to introduce Rob Fulp. Uh, <clears throat> Rob has been the uh, CEO of several banks and is now a leader at Great Southern Bank. He was our executive in residence for two years at Missouri State before taking his current position. He's also been a trustee of the University Foundation, chair of the College of Business Executive Advisory Committee, chair of the board at Cox Health, where he led the successful search for their new 
CEO, and except for maybe me, no one loves the university more. Rob? Thank you, Cliff. You know, before Cliff leaves the building, could we all truly show a heartfelt appreciation for our 11th president and what he's done for this university? Thank you. What a beautiful day on our campus. You know, I'm a, I'm a very proud alum. I love and I have passion for Missouri State University. And there's this, this campus formed me who I am today uh, as a young man, as a freshman coming to school here from a small town. And that's why I continue to give back here and come back here as often as possible. It's obvious that those who know me know of my love and my passion for this university. But today, we're gonna, we got a, a search to, to run, and I'm very proud to be the chairman of your search committee. And I'm gonna go over the time frame. I'm gonna go over a lot of um, potential timing issues that we're going to be working on, and we've got a tremendous search committee We'll be working with the Board of Governors. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a great time to be here. So the timeline. Everybody wants to know, you know, is what's on top of the mind when it comes to high level national search. This is a national search. We've already hit a couple of our milestones. Cliff announced his retirement on September the 6th. The President's Search website went live on September 6th. The application window opened on September 6th. The search committee was approved on September 20th. And here today, we talk, to, here today talked in more detail about the search and also provide an opportunity for input from, from you on who you would like to be our next president to take this table and what you would like for them to bring to our table. November 1 is the first day of consideration, which means the search committee will begin to review the applications and narrow down the number of applicants to a smaller pool of semi-finalists. We expect to be in the eight to 12 candidate range, but it depends on the application pool. Once the search committee finalizes the semi-finalist list, we will meet with them in person to conduct interviews. Based on those interviews, we will narrow the pool down to two to four finalists. We'll bring to campus for two-day interviews that will include both the Springfield and the West Plains campuses. Hiring the president is, is the responsibility of the Board of Governors. The search committee's role is to present a qualified slate of finalists for the board to meet, interview, making their hiring decision. The search committee does not rank the finalists when they present the slate to the board. As you can see from the time frame, this is scheduled to take place beginning November and ending March of 2024. The search committee will be working hard to meet those deadlines that were set by the board. You can learn everything you need to know about the search by accessing the President's Search website via a call to action button on the university homepage. It also appears on the menu item under About Missouri State. You can also access it via the President's page or just search the site using President Search or call me. You can help me in the search committee by providing input, but, but you're here today because you love, you care for Missouri State University. And in a couple of minutes, we will ask you to respond to some questions, then we'll open the floor for input, which you would like to provide. 
You can also complete the survey that appears on the search site, or you can send input using presidentsearch at missouristate.edu. Let's get started with the gathering input. If you are on Zoom, you will have the opportunity to participate in the Zoom poll. We'll let the live audience participate by a show of hands for each question. So this is where I need your help. Question one, which is the following qualities, which of the following qualities is the most important to the success of the next president of Missouri State? Audience should get one vote. Extensive higher education administration experience. Again, this is by hand. Academic experience as a member of faculty. Strong track record of fundraising and financial management. Strong track record of successful government relations. Mm -hmm. Active participation in the community in a leadership capacity. A strong collaborative management style. Thank you. Let's see how they voted on Zoom. So on Zoom, uh, the strong collaborative management style was also the winner. Could you please, can you all hear, hear that clear enough? Maybe just me. Would you please repeat that again, please? Sure, on Zoom, uh, the strong collaborative management style was the, received the most votes. Okay, thank you. Question number two, what do you see as the university's biggest challenge? One vote only. Increasing campus enrollment. Recruiting qualified faculty staff. Retaining faculty staff. Increasing donations to Missouri State. Improving, expanding Missouri State facilities. Let's see how they voted on Zoom. On Zoom, it was close, but retaining faculty and staff received the most votes. Second to increasing campus enrollment. Very good, thank you. Now we have some questions for you to think about. We'll open the floor for your input. We have a couple of folks running the mics, so you need to raise your hand if you have a question or input. To be fair to all, your question input can't exceed two minutes. That's the question and the response. And we just happen to have a two minute hourglass timer to, to keep us honest. I welcome the questions. Raise the hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, now that's, is that two more than Cliff had or is that just one more? I'm joking, go ahead. <laughs> uh, President Smart never decreased uh, the number of employees. So when the new president uh, uh, finalists are called in, will you please make sure and get a commitment that he or she will not shrink the employee base? That is my request and in a way question also, can it be asked of the finalists whether under tight conditions you may 
uh, let go some staff, some faculty, etc. And my second question is... I'll, I'll take note of that first one, yes. And, uh, and my second question is, uh, are the finalists expected to support affirmative action? Would you please repeat the question? Are the finalists who come to our campus, the last three or four finalists, will they be asked, do you support affirmative action or do you oppose affirmative action? Can such a question even be asked of them? Would you please help me with that, please? <laughs> So I think probably most people in the audience are familiar with the recent Supreme Court opinion. And so if the question is, would our next president be willing to violate what the Supreme Court has said is the law in terms of affirmative action and admissions, uh, I've never been part of a search where we've asked someone if they would be willing to violate the law. Um, we are, however, a federal contractor. And as a federal contractor, we have extensive affirmative action obligations in hiring. As, uh, that's, that is passed down to us from the Office of Federal Contractor Compliance Programs. And so that would be an expectation. It's a contractual requirement, period. Uh, and so I don't know that it would specifically be a question that's asked, but anyone who would apply here should know that we're a federal contractor because it's very apparent. Thank you for the question, and thank you for the answer. <laughs> Next question. Next question. Are there any questions on Zoom? So we have one comment, and they ask, uh, their comment is, they would like the new president to be forward-thinking adaptable and proactive in addressing challenges. This involves a combination of strategic planning, effective communication, and commitment to innovation and continuous improvement. Was that a comment or was that just a question? It was a comment. Th thank you. There was no question mark. We'll take note of that. And I have another, I do have a question. Will the committee find a new president who will continue working toward Missouri State joining an FBS conference? In the what conference again? <laughs> oh, you know, that at this, at this time, we take everything under consideration. We're looking for the absolutely best applicant to continue to lead this university. But as far as anything detailed, we're not we're not to that point. I'll add one quick one to your second yeah. question, but I'd flip it around. What does the city of Springfield want to tell us to help us recruit? Would you please repeat that again? Your second question on what qualities of the city would motivate a candidate do you have a sense from the city what they would like to offer? You know, I, I, do, I do not have a sense from the city. I am very engaged in the community. Uh, I know that they have been extremely, extremely pleased with Cliff Smart. And, and Cliff has, uh, has really raised the bar with his relationship with this entire, entire region, the city officials all the above, so I would just say to enter your question, I would hope that we would absolutely continue the same, same pattern and the journey would continue what Cliff has laid. Thank you for that. There's one up there, hi. President Smart had a great uh, social media presence, so would you deem it appropriate for us to expect the same from an upcoming president? Great question. Um, you know, I, I think President Smart has done such a tremendous job how he has engaged with the students and the community and the region and the state and nationally. 
I mean, I, uh, I follow him, and I, I know that there's probably not many presidents of universities our size uh, that, that probably do that. I have seen some that has attempted to do that, but um, he really does a great job on keeping everybody connected to what's going on here on a daily basis. And from morning to noon, late night, every day. So, you know, everyone's different about that. I'll let the new candidate decide that on their own. But I would say that it would, uh, it's a nice, it's something to sure be encouraged to do if that's what they feel comfortable. Great question. We've got one right here. This is a question slash comment. First of all, thank you for um, doing this work to help us find a new president. That's very much appreciated. I have not chaired a search of this level, obviously, but I know that search committees are a lot of work, so thank you. And thank you to the members of the search committee. Um, Cliff has historically been very supportive of staff at Missouri State University, very selfishly being a staff member. <laughs> I'm curious, um, I noticed that the makeup of the search committee only has two official staff members in terms of like that capacity, um, which I understand you can't make the search committee include every single person because that would get out of hand. Um, but w I guess this is also a request slash question, but I would like to see our next president um, also have that same sort of focus and support for staff as well as faculty. So, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a great uh, comment and uh, the question both. And uh, yes, I would happen to, to agree with you. Regarding the search committee ma makeup, that was approved by the Board of Governors. And uh, you know, I think it does have a, a very well diverse uh, faculty, community, staff, it does have, a, I think it's a great makeup and, and I was very pleased when I first saw it uh, after I got choked on the, on the chairman part of it. Uh, that I, thought that, I thought the rest of the committee was very, very strong and I really liked the makeup of it as well. We've got one right here in the middle, please. Thank you so much. I have a quick question. Um, you've talked about this being a national search, as it should be. Um, and without the use of an executive search firm and their networks and connections, what are your tacti tactics or strategies to make sure you're attracting national level talent? Yeah, yeah we, we've already uh, uh, have, have that in place where we are in national publications that, are, that, are, that the faculties across the country and, and higher level education, receive that on a daily basis. You know, and uh, they, uh, every university does it differently regarding hire a search firm. Uh, I was told it hasn't quite worked here, you know, on a consistent basis. Um, you know, it's, um, it's everybody's choice, you know, but I do think from what Cliff said earlier, we have a, our internal uh, search firm that, uh, that I am in constant communication with them, and I can assure you that the search is going very well. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that question. I just wanted to add into that. Um, I'm the one that's running the logistics on that. So we have publicized in the Chronicle of Higher Education as well as Inside uh, Higher Ed. And with those, we added on some of those extra features to make sure that those were pushed out to newsletters as well as 50 specific diversity websites and job boards as well. Um, so in addition to that, we also have a nomination form on the presidential search site. So if there's anybody that you have in mind, whether they are internal working at Missouri State now or if they're someplace else in the nation, we want you to and we encourage you to nominate those individuals in which we will reach out to them specifically to tell them about the process and bring them up to speed on how they apply. Thank you.
Any other? Rob, we have some questions from. On Zoom, okay. Zoom. Uh, the first one, could you please describe what activities will be included during the on-campus interviews? Will there be a Q&A forum for faculty and staff? Well, there will be, when we do get this down to a short list uh, of candidates, there will be uh, a community forum that the Board of Governors will be in charge of. And that, that will, I think I mentioned that earlier, this, uh, it's a two or three day process. Am I right on that? Am I right? Three day process, council, yeah. So no, thank you again for that question. So that is something that the board as well as the search committee will have a hand in. Um, typically it will follow what we have done in the past, which is a two day all extensive sort of intensive, if you will, where they will also visit the Mountain Grove and West Plains campuses, but also meet with faculty, staff, um, specifically faculty senate, staff senate, those groups, as well as having open forums is something that we anticipate. Thank you. Other comments, questions on Zoom? Questions in the oh, audience? Oh, sorry about that, I had it on mute. Uh, here's the question. Will the new president be asked about his commitment to tenure track faculty positions rather than trending toward more lower paid instructors? Would you please repeat that again? It's kind of an echo where I am. Okay. Will the new president be asked about his, his or her commitment to tenure track faculty positions rather than trending toward more lower paid instructors? Uh, Council, could I have your assistance on that, on that question? As you're looking down on your phone, Lisa. thank you. I think candidly it's difficult at this I mean keep in mind there are six faculty members who are on the search committee they will have significant input into questions asked to candidates particularly as we're identifying semi-finalists um, that being said uh, because they've asked the lawyer to answer this question you get a legal answer which is it is not primarily university presidents who are attacking tenure it is legislatures who are attacking tenure and so I think we have to be mindful of that as well but I anticipate that faculty members on the committee will well represent the interest of our faculty, both our ranked, unranked, tenured, and untenured. Thank you. Well, seeing no other hands up, it's until then. Um, I guess going off that, how do you think the committee will attract candidates who are maybe on the fence of applying here and coming to Missouri, given potential and future legislation that may be attacking education? Um. <laughs> they keep with their hands up, so I can't answer that. So this actually is not a legal question. Um, so, so I would point out it's not just Missouri, right? If you look across the country, there are a number of states that are attacking all things education, including higher education, including K through 12 education. I can't imagine any candidate who's going to apply for this is not well aware both of the realities of higher ed across the country and has not, if they're not already living in or familiar with Missouri, uh, if they've not done their homework, we probably don't want them here, right? Uh, but a big part of what the search committee does is not just vet candidates to figure out who we want, but we also have to, as search committee members, I'm not on the search committee, I am ex officio, but we have to sell the candidates on both the university and on the community, including how we've worked effectively with our government relations folks to 
uh, effectively advocate for the university, even in trying political and financial situations. And so that's a big part of it. It's also a big part of why it's important when we have candidates on campus for people to show up and engage with them and show that we have an engaged, involved populace across the campus community. But yeah, in the same way that we know already that all of, folk, you know, all of our employees, when we're trying to hire people, are students, these are real questions that they have. And so we have to be prepared to be honest about them uh, and, and also talk about how we have had successes to date. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> Rob, I've, there is another question on Zoom. Yes. Uh, what government relations experience might the committee look for? What government relations, what? Uh, sorry? What government relations experience might the committee look for? You know, we, we the, the, yes, I would say for that, um, I think that it's, it's, we're going to look at every facet of the applications on that, and that uh, at this time, that's where we're going to, I'll just leave it at that for now. Are there any other uh, questions on Zoom, Suzanne? There are none. Are there any here in the audience today? Well, then the Q&A section has now uh, ceased on that and a little bit early, but uh, great questions and, and I think great responses. I appreciate staff stepping up. I've never called on council as many times before in my life to help me, but I really appreciate your help on that. So we really, so, so where we go from here, it, the, the journey is just really started on this. We have a lot of work to do. And I'm just going to commit, as we close today, I'm just going to commit to you that we're going to get this right. And we're going to bring in and hire a president that you all are going to be very proud of. With that, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here, thank you for coming, and thank you for your love and support of Missouri State University.